Well, good morning. I feel tired now for some reason. No, it's, it's are you praying for Metro? Um, because I, I think that um, the fact that we're praying, the fact that we're working, the fact that we're striving is the reason why we get to do things like that. And even if they um, stumble a little bit in our, in our application, that is still, how heartwarming is it to see, to see that this is, a, this is a family that we're talking about. We're talking about not only your family, but we're talking about our family. And not all of you attend here on a regular basis. Some of you are coming in from out of town from, or from, from different, uh, different cities. And that's fine because we, we don't just have the family that attends here on a regular basis, but we have an extended family. And it's so great to be that, to be just that, the family of God. And we should be so thankful for the blessing of being that family. So we're going to go before our Father in prayer at this, at this time, and we're going to thank Him for that, for that blessing. We thank Him for so many other blessings on so many other occasions, but th- this morning I want to focus on the blessing of God making us family. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Mighty God, we come before you now so thankful for the family that you have given us, and we thank you for the reason why we were able to have that family in the first place. The means by which you have made us brothers and sisters, the means by which you have, you have bound us together by blood, Father not just by acquaintance, not just by information or things in common, but by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the cross for our sins. Lord, we thank you for that bond that is stronger than iron. And Father, we ask that you remind us of that bond daily so that we can know that in, when we face our hardships, when we face our trials, when we face our tribulations, Father, we are never alone. Not only do we have you, not only do we have the blessing of your Son and the, and the comfort of your Holy Spirit, but Father, we have each other as well. And we thank you for that. Lord, help us to be mindful of our family daily. And help us, be, help us to live to the benefit of your glory. In Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. The passage I have for you this morning um, is not a common Mother's Day passage. Uh, there are, I, I'm, I'm certain you know this. You've probably been to enough Easter services, Mother's Day services... Uh, Christmas services that preachers tend to to know that preachers tend to develop you know standard <laughs> normal delivery sermons uh, for those events. Um, typically, we talk about the same passages. We, we'll, a preacher will get two or three that he'll rotate uh, on the uh, on that specific day. Um, I try as hard as I can to not be that guy. Um, I don't want to diminish the blessing of a day like Mother's Day by giving it a rote, phoned-in sermon that you've heard a million times before. I want, I want to give you something unique, something, something meaningful, um, something that really speaks more than just uh, to the real heart of Mother's Day, more than just kind of what I might call a, a Hallmark card sermon. But this is a passage that I'm certain many of you didn't expect because... It's not a normal one we go to for Mother's Day, but it's one of the best motherhood stories that I can think of. And it's amazing to me, before we get to it, it's, it's amazing to me how, how complimentary the Bible is of mothers. And how meaningful in God's Word the, the role of, of, of motherhood is. Last year, I believe it was, we talked about 1 Timothy 2, which is again another passage that we don't normally go to on Mother's Day because it has the whole silence thing in it. But there's a, there's a statement in 1 Timothy 2 that is one of the most meaningful in all of Scripture to me. And it's in direct reference to motherhood and it says that, that women are saved through childbirth. And there's been so many misinterpretations of that verse. Some people saying, well, that, that's saying, the Bible is saying that if, you, if you're a female and you don't have children, you can't be a true Christian. Absolutely not. That is not what that's saying at all. What it's saying is something that we should all know, that God, God the Father, the creator of mankind and the universe and everything that we experience on this plane of existence, when he sat down to plan out how he was going to save mankind from their sins, he decided the first step, the opening move of that chess game against Satan was to have his son, our Savior, be born of a woman. The, the whole world, 
You know, we all know the, the salvation passage, especially the most famous one, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever might believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. God accomplished that through motherhood. He sent that son to this earth through motherhood. Through a young, nervous girl named Mary. I mean, imagine the, the trust he must have from others if he decides to send his son through a virgin birth. So when Paul says that in 1 Timothy, that, that women are saved in childbirth, women are saved in childbirth because we have all been saved in childbirth. The only reason why we can claim salvation is because to us, to quote Isaiah, to us, a child has been born. It's amazing to me how complimentary the Bible is of motherhood. But it's not just in that passage. There's passages in the Old Testament that reiterate this as well. We can think of so many others, and maybe we'll do this one next year, but do you remember the story uh, of Elisha where he finds the mother who's struggling to feed her child and she has the jugs of oil that are empty and he, he gives her a test of faith where she keeps pulling out, pouring out the oil from these jugs and it just keeps going and going and going and going until she has enough oil to sell and provide for her son. There's something about motherhood that God finds deeply beautiful because there's something inherently beautiful about motherhood. And one of the stories that, that illustrates this for, for me the most beautifully is found in Exodus chapter 2. This woman isn't named here. She's named later. Her name is Yohimed. And it tells us here, it just refers to her as a Levite woman in this passage, but, but that's who this is. And it says, Now a man from the house of Levi took as his wife a Levite woman. Now we have to remember too that they are living, under, they are living in Egypt, in Goshen, under the rule of the pharaohs. And this is a pharaoh, this specific pharaoh that they're living under. There are three that rule in the book of Exodus. There's the pharaoh before Moses. There's the Pharaoh during Moses' adolescence, and then there's the Pharaoh that Moses gets, in, gets into it with for the actual Exodus itself. But this Pharaoh is the really, really bad one because he's the one that sees these, these Jewish people who are living as slaves in Egypt, and he sees how quickly they're populating and how quickly they're reproducing. And he realizes that, hey, wait a second, there's way more of them <laughs> than there are of us. And if they ever get into their heads to rise up against us, well... Their numbers could overwhelm us. So he comes up with a plan. Now, it's not necessarily a plan that you and I would come up with, but it's one that he came up with. What we're going to do is we're going to go and send the soldiers out into Goshen, and they're going to find these little baby boys. And they're going to take them, and they're going to throw them into the Nile. The reason why they're going to throw them into the Nile is because of what's waiting for them hungry in the Nile. Now, can you imagine living under that regime as a mother? Can you imagine being pregnant when you hear that decree come down from the throne? I want you to imagine being Yohimid for a second. I know this is very mother, female-centric, but that's fine. Men, we can, we can allow that this morning, I think. But I want you to imagine being Yohimid, living on her street in the world that she lives in and seeing the patrols looking for babies to kill. Verse 2, the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was such a fine child, she hid him three months. There's a couple things in this verse that I find interesting. It's like, wait, is that saying that if he had been an ugly baby, she would have given him up? <laughs> Did you, okay, I know, this is a little, this isn't necessarily PC, but there is such a thing as an ugly baby. I, I don't know if you know that or not. Not all babies are created equal. <laughs> that's not what that's saying. This is saying something of motherhood that we all know because this is her firstborn son. This is her oldest. She'll have two other children, Aaron and, and Miriam. Miriam, uh, this is her oldest son. Miriam is the, old, is, is the older, old, older sister, but Aaron will be born after. So Moses is the oldest son, but the middle child. I want to tell you a story. It's a little bit of a personal story, and I know I do this a lot, but, and this one's going to paint her in a good light, so don't worry about it. 
when we first got married, um, I think I've told you this before, but when we first got married, um, Stephanie wasn't a big fan of kids. It's just the way she grew up. She grew up not really liking kids very much. I mean, she babysitted it a lot, but, you know, listen, <laughs> and I believe this, as a, as a former youth minister, I believe this is good, solid advice. Use it for your children, especially if you have teenagers. You know what the best, uh, the, the best encouragement for abstinence is among teenagers? Other people's kids. Really. <laughs> have your kids babysit someone else's toddler, and they will stay away from the opposite sex as much as they possibly can, okay? Um, yeah, but she grew up um, not really being very endeared to children, and I grew up wanting a big family. Um, my dad wanted us to have five kids so he could have an even ten grandkids. <laughs> that didn't happen, <laughs> nor will it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but when we first got married, we had this conversation. Where she, before she met me, she was saying, uh, I don't want to ever have kids. And then we got married. And I think because of her love for me, we, we talked about it. She said, okay, we'll have some kids, but maybe in five years. Five years, after five years of marriage, we'll start talking about it and see what we'll do. But we still wanted to practice for it, so our first year anniversary rolled around. And how do you practice for having kids? Well, you get a dog. <laughs> right? So we got this little German Shepherd puppy, and we had her. Her name was Sugar. Don't name a dog sugar. It's a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> because God has a sense of irony. Uh, <laughs> um, well, for our first year anniversary, we bought this dog. Well, our first year anniversary comes. About two weeks pass. And then she, I come home from school and Stephanie is crying. And the reason why she's crying is because she has taken three separate pregnancy tests and all of them say positive. And it's one in the morning now because we've been dealing with this all day. And she said, maybe it's not true. It's like, well, no, there's no such thing as a false positive on a pregnancy test. So you're pregnant. And she told that to her doctor later. She said, well, how do you think, why do you think you're pregnant? Well, I took three and they all said positive. He said, well, yep, you're pregnant. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we're sitting there. It's one in the morning. And Stephanie's crying. Because she doesn't feel ready for this. And dogs can sense emotion. Did you know that about dogs? That they can sense emotion? And this little puppy sees his mom, crying, and she crawls up into her, her lap and she starts licking the tears off of her cheek. And I kid you not. Stephanie looks up at me across. I've got my arm around her. She has this dog licking her face. She goes, I already have a baby! <laughs> and then the second trimester rolled around and she's like, get rid of that dog. And we did. We gave it away. Um... She was uncertain right up until we went to the hospital to have Avon. I would say that she was probably even uncertain. I'm not trying to step into her head, and I don't want to necessarily speak for her here, but I believe this. She was uncertain for the, for the 21 hours of labor she was in. That uncertainty evaporated like steam rising off of a pot of boiling water, the moment she saw that little boy who was purple, whose head was this thick and that long, <laughs> he's still goofy looking, but he was especially goofy looking then. Not a doubt in her mind the moment she saw that baby. That's what the Bible is saying here. Imagine the heartache, the worry, the uncertainty that must have been brewing for nine months in Yohemed's mind because she knew this was happening. She knew that the moment they find out, what if it's a boy? Because they didn't know. If it's a girl, I get to keep it and I can, I can show her off and not worry about it. But if it's a boy, what do I do? Maybe she even had plans. Maybe she, maybe she had any questions. She had doubts. She was, afraid for, she was afraid for herself. She was afraid for her older daughter. She was afraid for her husband. But the moment she saw that boy, what happened? Gone. When she saw 
that he was a fine child. She took him and hid him three months. Can you imagine trying to hide a baby, baby's existence, for three months, for the first three months of their lives? Babies make noise. Did you know that? Thankfully, thankfully newborns are, are pretty androgynous. Um, I remember, I remember, uh, <laughs> she's not in here to get embarrassed by this. Um, I remember Stephanie gluing a little pink bow to Harmony's little single tuft of hair so that she didn't have to deal with the, uh, oh, what a cute little boy <laughs> thing when she was real little. Um, so maybe she pretended it was a girl for a while or she kept him hidden or maybe people didn't know. I mean, they had to have known, but there would have been a network of other mothers trying to help her hide him, let them know when the patrols were coming. She hides him for three months until she can't hide him anymore. Now, I want you to imagine being Yohimid that morning when there's an impromptu search and you didn't expect the guards and, they, and by the time you see them, it's, it's too late. What plan do you come up with? We read, a little too, we read a little too much into this plan, folks. We, uh, we make this more elaborate than it actually is. She takes a basket. When she could hide him no longer, she took from him a basket made of bulrushes or papyrus, depending on your translation. Same thing. And daubed it with bitumen and pitch and tar and pitch. Same thing. Basically to make it what? Waterproof. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. Now, that's a very important point. Where does she put it? She puts it in the reeds. The Sunday school audience among us wants to think that she put that baby in the basket, put the lid on it, kicked it out to the current, and walked away. That is not what happened. She put him in the reeds, expecting him to stay put. And then she turned around, went back inside. Why? To meet the guards. But Miriam, she leaves behind. We know that she expected him to stay put because she leaves Miriam behind. Now, we're not exactly sure how old Miriam is. We think that she's somewhere around 8, 9, 10, somewhere around there. Old enough to to be responsible enough to follow this baby down river <laughs> when he starts to move, but not old enough to stop him from moving. Okay? So this baby begins to travel. Miriam can't run back inside. Why? Mom, mom, the basket, wink, wink, is moving. Can't do that because they've got swords and they're ready to kill him. So she does the only thing a child can do. She follows him down river. And I love the fact that the verse here actually <laughs> skips some steps. It says, and his sister stood at a distance to know what will be done to him because she sees him moving. Basket's moving. What do I do? Well, the only thing you can do is follow. Verse 5, now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe the river. Wait, wait, wait. There's some information left out. <laughs> is the Nile a small river or a big river? It's the second biggest river on the planet trumped only by the Amazon in South America. Okay? Huge river, more than a mile across at some point, at some points. Not only is it a wide river and a big river with a very powerful current, it is a well-traveled river. It is the lifeblood of Egypt. There are boats and barges coming up and downstream constantly. This would be like putting your baby, this would be like putting your baby in a shopping cart and then seeing that shopping cart veer on to a crowded freeway with cars moving at full speed. But this is actually even more dangerous than a freeway because guess what else the Nile has in it? The biggest crocodiles on the face of the planet. 
There's one crocodile in Egypt named Gustav. They think he might be dead, but they're not sure. He's bigger than all the other ones. They think he's about 150 years old. And according to African folklore, that one crocodile is responsible for 182 human fatalities. Crocodiles, if you think that mankind isn't in the food chain, you've never been to Egypt. (laughs) There's crocs. There's boats. There's a current. This thing is, and how seaworthy is this basket? Did she have time to sit down at a drafting table and engineer this bad boy so it won't tip over? She grabbed the first thing she could, a basket, put some tar on it to keep it from leaking. I doubt she did a very good job. There's probably some leaks in it. And then she just puts it there because did she expect this thing to travel downriver? No, she expected it to stay put. And there's another piece of information that this leaves out. What happens to Yohemin's mind? She comes back to the bank and she sees no Miriam and no basket. Imagine being her in that moment. But I want you to notice something. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe the river while the young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. Princesses don't scoop things out of the water. I mean, they they have them brought to them. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, Yeah, I bet the baby's crying. (laughs) I'd be crying. (laughs) She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Talk about a smart little girl. I got a smart little girl. They're dangerous. We should never have taught her how to read, Steph. We really shouldn't have. She knows too much. But talk about a smart little girl, sharp as a whip, sharp as a tack, quick as a whip. Look at her. Verse 7, Then his sister, Miriam, said to the Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse a child for you? Guess who she's talking about? I happen to know a Hebrew lady that's currently in her milk. She's talking about Yohimit, her mother, Moses' mother. Then it tells us later in the text that Pharaoh names him. Pharaoh's daughter names him, Moses, which means to draw out. Guess how long it takes Moses to be weaned? Three years. Three years. She got to raise her son. And she got to be in his life past that three years too. Because nurses tend to stuck around. So what's this all mean? Why, why this verse for Mother's Day? Well, what if, I know this is a hard question to ask and I know it's not necessarily when we like asking but What if she had given him up? Does God have plans for this kid? Why does he venture downriver? Because God causes him to venture downriver. He ventures downriver from Goshen to Memphis, where where Pharaoh's daughter is, which is quite a trip. He ventures downriver because God has use for that kid in Memphis. He needs him to be a prince of Egypt. Not just a Jewish-born son or a Levite, but a prince of Egypt. He's going to save his people with this kid. He tends to do that. Kind of ironic, huh? He's going to save his people with this kid. It's God that pushes him into the current, not Yohemed. What if she had given him up? The moment I ask that question, what is your immediate answer for those mothers in the room? What if she had given him up? You know the answer to that question. She wouldn't have been able to do so. Why? Because he's an innocent child? Because he's a particularly cute innocent child? 
What if he had been ugly? What if he had had a hair lip? Who knows? Why can't she do it? Because she's what? His mother. Her faith is rewarded. She gets to be in her child's life. God isn't a cruel God. He wouldn't just take her, him from her cold. But he needs that boy. So here's this life that God needs, not only to save his people, but, so that his pe- but all, also so that all of us can be saved. Because if the seed line dies in Egypt, there can be no Jesus. And if there's no Jesus, then we're all sunk. So in order to save mankind, not just his people, but us as his people, he needs that little boy to be in Egypt. So what does he do? He needs him to be Jewish. He doesn't change the plan and make him an Egyptian baby and go with that. Here's what he does. He gives him to the person that he knows will do everything they can to make sure that that baby makes it. And who is it? He doesn't give Moses as a baby to an army of men. He doesn't put him at the feet of a king. He gives him over to the safest place that any human being could ever live. The love of a mother who will do anything to protect her child. This is kind of saying the same thing, church, that Paul is saying in 1 Timothy. There can be no greater compliment to the love of motherhood than this. You and I have salvation today because that little boy went to Egypt. You and I have salvation today because he grew up and came back and said, let my people go. You and I have salvation because he saved his people who could go back to their promised land and that family could grow and grow with God tracing that scarlet thread from the 1,400 years from Moses to Jesus. So that 2,000 years ago, God's son, also born of a woman, can go to a cross for our sin. And he accomplished that feat, not just with his own love, which is infinite, but the perfect illustration of God's infinite love. In closing, I know we say this a lot. I know we refer to God as a hymn, and he is a hymn. That's a reference to him being father. It's not that he has gender so much as it is. He is, he is a father in his authority. That's why we call him him. But I am convinced, church, I don't know about you, But I am convinced that outside of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for our sins, as the perfect example of the love that God has for us, there's a hotly contested second place. One of the world's most perfect examples of the infinite love that Father has for children is the love that he endowed from mother to children. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my mom loves me. How about you? Just like I can know that my mom loves me, I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my father loves me and will do anything he can to keep me not only safe, but saved. Why do mothers illustrate that so well? Because if mothers do anything, You see, fathers are great because fathers protect, they defend, but you know what mothers do? They rescue. They rescue. And if this had been left up to Moses' father, he probably would have just fought the guards. But what did Yohemed do? She couldn't fight to defend him. So she rescued him instead. And if it's anything, church, what does God do for us? He loves us and rescues us. 
So my question to you this morning is simple. Have you been rescued from your sins? Have you been rescued by a God who put it in mothers to love you as much as they do? When a mother loves her child, that is not her behaving according to genetics or some, some nebulous, you know, motherly instinct that exists beyond her. That's not genetics. It's not DNA that's doing that. It is the image of God, church. Amen? Mothers love their children because God made mothers to love their children. And we're all here today because of the love of a mother 3,500 years ago who had enough faith when she saw the guards coming to try and rescue her son by putting him in a reed basket. Don't let that faith she had go to waste because the result, the payment of that faith that you had had that God would protect her son, which is rewarded, is made manifest in the salvation that you and I enjoy today. And if you haven't had that salvation yet, don't let her faith go to waste. All you need to do is come. Will we stand and sing?